You are about to experience Jackson Snyder Presents. We will examine the life of our master, Yeshua, by discovering his ancestors, family, and friends, by reviewing rare ancient manuscripts, and speaking to those who know him best. From the Vero Essene Yahad, now experience Jackson Snyder Presents. We learned last time about prophecy and apocalypse, the difference between the two, and there is a big difference. We just understand the uh, idea of telling the future as prophecy, but once again, prophecy begins with, thus saith Yahweh, exclusively. You're only going to find prophecy as such in what's called the Old Testament, in the prophetic, in the prophetic books, the great prophets. Apocalyptic, on the other hand, is not prophecy. It does not tell the future. Apocalyptic tells the present history, say, for the last few years, usually in a voice that comes from a much earlier time. Like, for instance, the book of Daniel is not a prophecy, it's an apocalypse. Uh, a person who is speaking in the voice of Daniel, which is a, really a great honor for that prophet, but doing so 300 years after Daniel is explaining in cryptic, symbolic language that Jews will understand what's happening right there at his time, up until the time he's writing. So he is reiterating uh, history as he experiences it in the name of a prophetic voice and in symbolic language. Why? Because he's being invaded. He does not want the enemy to know what he's writing about, but he is writing a newspaper or a broadcast or an encrypted mail to the Jews that are out there in dispersion to let them know what's happening here in Jerusalem, because they understand that type of language. Same with the Revelation. The Revelation is not a prophecy, it's an apocalypse. And Yochanan, the Revelator, is doing the same thing. He's in the spirit on the Kirikoi Hemera, the day of Yahweh. That means that he's not on Patmos anymore. He has been somehow delivered in a spiritual or, or multidimensional sense back to Jerusalem because the day of the Lord is the day of the retribution against primarily Jerusalem, but all Israel too. Last time we were in uh, this series, we talked about the Old Testament prophecies concerning the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord. That day, as we found in those prophets, was the day of retribution against an Israel that had for many years not only been apostate, but its shepherds and leaders had been so apostate, so uh, desirous for gain, so misleading, and so dishonest with the Levitical priests that were out in the country as to not even pay them so they couldn't even eat and starve, that he got tired of it. And what he did was he gathered gathered up all of Israel into Jerusalem behind the walls, as we will see. And then the day of Yahweh came, which we will date. And with the day of Yahweh came Messiah's second coming. I should have done a drum roll. Uh, pretend I didn't say it. Oh, three people left. Oh, no, they're going. They're all going away. They're going away. Okay, that's the difference. So we know what the day of Yahweh is. Now, Matthew 24, this discourse is reiterated in Mark 13 and in Luke chapters 19 and 21. But I want to go through it from stem to stern, all 51 verses, but I want to go fast. All right. And I'm going to help you to understand it. So if you have a scripture, you might want to just go through and jot down a couple notes because we're going to correct the language in there and we're going to see it in a whole different light. Matthew 24, 1. Now, as Yeshua was going out of the temple courts and walking away, his disciples came to show him the temple buildings. I don't know what translation this is. And he said to them, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another. All will be torn down. This was the exact thing that he was being accused of at his trial. He says that he's going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Do you remember? This is the very word that got him trouble. And of course, somebody in his gang has gone back to the priests 
these usurpers who called themselves Zadokites but were not, and Yahshua himself being a Zadokite priest, I'm sure they thought, oh, we got him now. We got him now. He's going to destroy King Herod's temple. Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be torn down. Well, that must have been fantastical for them. How could that possibly be? As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your parousia and the end of the aeon? All right, here's our first problem in translation. Underneath the word coming is parousia. Parousia is translated coming in all these Bibles, but only here. Every place else, the same word is translated as presence. Presence. Para, alongside. Usia, being. Being alongside or presence. It does not mean coming. Erkomai or erkatai, those mean coming, but this is presence. And this makes a difference later on, because we're going to find out, as we find in five witnesses in the New Testament, that it's not Yahshua's coming that they're looking forward to, but his secret presence. Oh, that sounds almost cultish of an idea. But we'll, we'll find out, and you can take your pick of which, which way you want to see it. But remember, when you read coming in these passages, it should be presence. That will be important for later, and the word is parousia. Yahshua answered them, watch out that no one misleads you. I'm going to tell you the same thing. Please, check me out. I'm not going to be the one to mislead you. I'm not asking you to trust me, but I will challenge anybody on this, including Billy Graham. Okay? Bring Billy's on. What, is he 95 now? I'll take Billy on. Sure. No problem. I'll take on any Baptist minister. I don't, hey, I don't want to be controversial. Uh-oh, what did you find there? Well, our brother Rex did. Look right there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What Bible is this? That's that New World Translation. New World Translation. New World Translation. Look here, and there's a there's an asterisk. What it says is, tell it. Oh, this smells good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is free? How do you get one? Oh, oh this is New World Translation. Yeah. Jehovah Witnesses? Oh, my goodness. Oh. Look here. Now we are marked. We've <laughs> had it. <laughs> no, we're not J.W. No, we're not big cultists, just little cultists. I've got a young literal translation that has presence. Presence. All right. Young's? It's yeah, just that's young one. should have if it's literal. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your presence and of the conclusion of the system of things. Well, that's a little off. Aeon, are you all right? Did you come to assassinate me or what are you looking for? Okay. I forgot that the camera is on. I came right oh, come here. on over here. Right, Let yourself be seen. Do what you do. Do best. I want I have to go to a kingdom hall for this? I mean, do they allow you to wear a mask? In there. I'll tell you what, you're better off in Jehovah Witnesses than you are in the Baptist Church, for instance. Yeah. John 1 translation, you bet they did. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God. A God was the Word. Or they turn it around, they say, a, the Word was a God. I'm sorry, that's correct, however you take it. If you take the word God out and say Elohim, then everything works out right. But if you got God with a capital G in there, it does not work out right. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with the Elohim. It's There's a ha in there in Greek, ha theoi, with the Elohim, and the Logos was and Elohim. Do we have problems with that? Not at all. We do have problems with, and the word was a God, but their translation is right. The common translation is wrong. I'm sorry. I, I am sorry about that, but you know, I, I translated these things myself, and I come up with these translations. I wonder, where in the world did these translators get this except in some conspiracy? And I got to say, that's what it is. It's the King James conspiracy. And with that, I'll have another uh, sip of wine, piece of cheese, and a morsel of bread. All right. Watch out that no one misleads you. Go on YouTube. Everyone will mislead you about this. For many will come in my name saying, I am uh, the Messiah, and they will mislead many. Well, yes, there were some. Many will come in my name just in that short time 
between the time that Yahshua was resurrected and we'll say 70 AD, where we have Dosithius, Menander, Magus, the Egyptians spoken of an axe, Thutis spoken of an axe, and of course Barabbas, and there are several more as well, that came forth claiming to be the Messiah of Israel, just in that short time. I am Messiah, and they will mislead many. So we got to get Christ out of there. I am the Messiah. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Make sure you're not alarmed, for this must happen, but the end is still to come. Now, we give, we get a little more specific here. We go back to the idea of the temple being flattened. That's the end he's speaking of. The next end that is to come is the end of evil coming up in our day in the seventh day. But there in the fifth day, the end that he promised was as he told his disciples, not one stone will be left upon another, all will be torn down. And we read in Josephus in the Jewish Wars, you got to remember that Josephus lived at this time and he did his history on the time right now that we're speaking of. He was born in 39, and he became a general of Israel. He was also born as a Sadducean priest in the high priestly family. His father, whose name was, oddly enough, uh, Theophilus. Formerly, his name was Mattathias, but he took the surname Theophilus, a Greek name that means God-liker, Theos-liker. So this Josephus was a very learned man, and he kept track of what was going on during the time of about 170 BC through his lifetime, which was about till 96 AD. So he lived about 60-some years. He tells us that the assassination of Yahshua's brother, Yaakov, James, known as James the Just at that time, was the incident that set off the, the Hebraic Jews in Israel into insurrection mode. Insurrection primarily first against the people that spoke Greek, including Jews that spoke Greek, Hellenist Jews, the pagans that were living in Jerusalem and Israel set them off against them, and set them off against anybody that they considered to be people of perversion and lechery. So first of all, James dies. He is a very, very popular opposition high priest. We are told in the histories of those times that James, the brother of Yahshua, actually wore the ephod and the linen and the turban of the high priest with the sacred name on that turban, Kadosh Yahweh, and he entered the Holy of Holies, the Kadosh Kadoshim, and there got upon his knees not to pour blood, but to pray for the deliverance of Israel for what he knew was coming upon it, because he knew exactly what his brother had prophesied, those things that we are reading right now. James did that in 62 AD. He was the priest of the people. The people elected him. The high priests of that day were entirely corrupt. The correct priesthood, as you know, was either in Egypt at the temple in Heliopolis or out in the wilderness, in wilderness camps preparing for battle. These ones in the wilderness camps, we call them today Qumran Essenes. We've got their literature. We know that they had, uh, outside of Israel, they had camps set up in the desert areas where they practiced military arts, getting ready for the big battle against all the perverse people, including Jewish and Hebrew people that had gone over to the Greek way of living, to the worship of Greek gods. And certainly, as I mentioned in Galilee many times, I've mentioned that a third of the people in Galilee were Hebrew Jews or Israelites, a third were Hellenistic Jews that spoke Greek and worshiped Greek gods, and a third were Gentiles that spoke Greek or Latin and worshiped pagan gods. The Hebrews, like James, those that went by holy standards, those that were of the sects of the Nazarenes and Nazarites and of the Essenes and of the various other sects that came out of the Zadokite priesthood movement, that priesthood had been usurped by the others, they were being pushed into the sea, just as today we hear the potentates of the Arabs claiming that they're going to push Israel into the sea. It was the same thing at that time. Hebrew believers were going to be pushed out, and by golly, they were not going to take it sitting down. They were going to fight. 
They were getting ready to fight, not because they were terrorists, although they were to some extent, but because they had something to protect. They had their way of life. They had their faith. They had their districts that were holy and their lands that were holy. These things were being trodden down by Gentiles. They even considered the Jews that were Hellenistic to be Gentiles. And by golly, they were going to fight to see that their laws and customs would be preserved if that meant fighting against the chief priests and murdering them all, if that's what it took. James was the head of that movement. Josephus calls it the innovation, the innovation, the fourth philosophy. We call it today Nazarene Israel. We think, oh, what a peaceful bunch of Essenes. These guys were not peaceful. They were pushed to learn the art of war, and that's what they did. And when their hero, the brother of Messiah, the opposition high priest, was murdered, thrown off the parapet of the temple, stoned after being buried up to his chest in the ground, stoned, and then brought out and clubbed to death. This is how he died, 62 AD, Yom Kippur. The whole nation of Hebrew believers, they went into an uproar while the others rejoiced, gave each other presents. Maybe you've heard something like that in some other prophecy. So this is what happened. And what Yahshua says in Matthew 24, 6, you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed. The end is still to come. He's talking about the day of Yahweh here which, as I told you, was a retribution on Israel, as we showed last week. Now look at seven. For nation will rise up against nation. Here we have a, a big translation error. The word nation behind that is ethnoi. We get the word ethnic in English. There were no nations at this time. No nations. The word ethnoi means tribes. For tribe will rise up in arms against tribe. That puts, first of all, it puts a local spin on the whole thing. When we read nation, we got an idea that this is going to happen on the whole earth. And this is exactly what's taught today, a, a, a lie, that this is going to happen on the all, all whole earth. It's not happened, but it's going to happen because the nations are going to rise up against nations. No nations at that time. We're talking about tribes here. Well, go check it out. And it says kingdom against kingdom. The word there is Basileia. It doesn't mean kingdom. There were no kingdoms at that time. Kingdom comes out of medieval England and the King James Version of the Bible. It just simply means, Basileia means a power base. We might say ge generically rulers against rulers, or as the Scholar's Version translates it, reigns against reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S. So here we have a local thing, not a worldwide thing. We don't have nations and kingdoms. There were no such things at that time, but we've got words behind them that we can translate correctly. Try Tribes and reigns. What's the difference between a kingdom and a reign? Think about it. There's a lot of difference. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. As for the famines, we read about them in Acts. There was a horrible famine during the reign of Claudius, whereas they, Paul himself was supposedly making up a collection for the Hebrews back in Jerusalem. And we've got a historical notice from Josephus that Queen Helen of Adiabene, whose king corresponded with Yahshua. We say Yahshua didn't write anything. Oh, yes, he did. We have the letters. They were found in the city hall of Edessa by Eusebius, the church historian. He was in contact with the king of Adiabene, which is up where Kurdistan is now. And the letters were concerning the king, Abgar the Black, asking Yahshua to come up there to get out of the trouble that he was in, in Israel. King Abgar sent one of his wives, Helen, with loads of money. She built a palace in Jerusalem. She bought the golden menorah in the Kadosh Kadoshim. She brought funds to spell the famine, and she brought two sons, Azotus and, oh, Azotus and, what's the other guy's name? Well, let's see, I think of it any other time. You can look it up. He brought, they brought, or she brought her sons. They converted to Nazarene Judaism. They were circumcised and they enlisted. Unlike most Nazarenes, they enlisted in the armies of Josephus, and they were both 
killed in the ensuing insurrections. Speaking of insurrections, we read about a place called Caesarea or Caesarea. That was the Roman headquarters. The Greeks rose up against the Jews in Caesarea, Caesarea, during this time, right after the death of James, killed them all. The other city, Antioch, that we read about all the time in Acts, the Hellenists rose up against the Jews there, killed them all. This is the place that Paul and Barnabas and Peter and the rest of them got in a fight that we read about in Galatians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Killed them all, thousands of them. From Also, we'll go on. This happened all over the country, and we read about the fulfillment in Josephus. From 50 to 70 AD, there were also more earthquakes in that 20-year period than there ever had been before in time that had been, time that had been um, historically recorded. So we've got these things happening, tribe against tribe, rain against rain, famines, earthquakes. All these things are the beginning of odion. Odion. This is a mystery word translated here, birth pangs. I looked it up in my lexicons. It has a variety of meanings. The main meaning is the pains of birth. We're thinking about what is being birthed here. I want to tell you, I'd like to go into that a little more, but I, I want to get through this, and I've, I've still got a half hour or 40 minutes. Birth pangs. I kind of see it as, a, in a psychological term, liminality, a liminal period, a period of upheaval and change. Whenever there's change, there's loss, you know. And whenever there's big pe- change, there are big losses. We're moving up to a war from 62 to 66 AD. We're moving towards a war. Josephus says that James' death was the last straw. And then he says, Vespasian came. We'll get into that in a minute. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted and will kill you. Does it say, we'll save you? They will kill you. You will be hated by all the tribes ethnoi, not nations, because of my name. We don't know much about that from this period, but if we go up to the period of about 132 to 135 AD, in the second Jewish revolt, we have letters from the Messiah of the second century, Simon bar Kosiba or Kochba. He was proclaimed Messiah by the rabbinate of Jamnia in about 132 AD. This is 60 years after we're talking about. And in those letters of Kosiba, we found him in the cave of letters down there by Qumran. We found all kinds of letters from bar Kochba, the Messiah. And in one of those letters, he tells his underlings, as far as the the Nazareans, what to do with them? They won't fight. So we can't even consider them to be of our nation, kill them or banish them. So now we know something about what he's talking about here, that everybody would persecute and kill you and would be hated by the tribes, not by the nations, by the tribes. What tribes are we talking about? We're talking about Judah, Levi, Benjamin, Naphtali, Issachar, that were down in that section of uh, south, uh, we call it Judea, in 132 to 136, the Second Jewish Revolt. We know what happened then. It certainly happened at this time, too. If Yahshua's brother started the war because of his death. All nations my sake. Okay. It, it says in Luke 21, 11, in the parallel passage, they will persecute you in the synagogues. Who had synagogues? Pharisees had synagogues. In prisons and before rulers. Then many will be led into sin and they will betray one another and hate one another. There was all-out war before the Romans even. Israel was being led by bands of lestai, that is, bands of highway robbers. They took over the country entirely. The governor of Syria that was over Israel couldn't do anything about them. They changed governors three or four times, trying to find a way to get these lestai, these highwaymen, out of power. Many of them just kept for themselves the leadership in small areas in Israel, and they were all in conspiracy to steal and kill and take all they could before they knew the Romans were on the way. They wanted to get what they could get and then get into Jerusalem where they knew that the Romans could never take that or anybody else. There they would be able to keep all the treasures that they had stolen from all the legitimate and uh, innocent people of the land. And when the Romans finally gave up, they would be rich. 
And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. I mentioned all the false prophets by name. And because lawlessness will increase so much, the love of many will grow cold. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is how we define love for us. Well, beloved, we have to take a little break now. We'll be back when it's finished, promise. Just as I promised, Jackson's Night of Present is back now to finish up message and fulfill promise. But the person who endures to the end will be saved. Now, the word there is uh, telos, whether that means the end of these troubled times or the end of their lives, we're not sure. When we go from the prophecy here to the apocalypse in Revelation, that is the fulfillment, Revelation, the fulfillment of this Olivet Discourse, then we will see what the end really means. And he says, the good news of the kingdom again, we would call it the reign, will be preached throughout the whole inhabited earth. You want to strike that out. The word behind earth here is gay. That's um, um, gamma eta, gamma eta, gay, or G-E with a slash over the top. We get the word these days in English, Gaia, on Earth Day. What it simply means is the land. It's not talking about the earth. It means earth in the sense of if you're potting plants and you're putting dirt and earth and soil in your hands. You would use that word for that. But in this case, this word doesn't mean earth. And the, the thing about it is in the New Testament, it is translated earth all the way through. When you see earth in, especially in the prophetic passages, always change it to land. You're better off that way because 75% of the time it means land, not dirt that you're planting in. So we're saying this will be preached throughout the land as a testimony to the, here's nations again, tribes, tribes. This is a local phenomenon, not something in the future that's worldwide. And then the end will come. And we're still wondering, question mark, question mark, what end is he talking about? If, we were, if we're speaking of the context of the day of Yahweh, then we're talking about the end of Israel, the total destruction and flattening of Jerusalem, as was prophesied time after time in uh, the Hebrew prophets. Next verse. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken about by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, he says, let the reader understand, a parenthetical note. We have to understand what the abomination of desolation is by going to Luke 21.20. In the parallel passage, it explains it. What we're being told is that they put an idol of some kind in the Holy of Holies. This is not what happened. These people, Nazarenes, like Yahshua HaMashiach and Yaakov HaZadik and the whole rest of them, did not believe the temple was holy. It had been completely desecrated by an evil, irresponsible, and unanointed priesthood who used it as a means of making money, who set up hot dog stands on the inside of the temple, who did all manner of desecrating sacrifices during this time. The biggest desecration was they weren't the true priesthood. How am I doing on time? Good. They believed that the city was holy, not the temple, that the city would be redeemed, the whole city. And the temple was just a part of the city, and the whole thing was corrupt, and it had to be cleaned up, even if it meant being destroyed. This Yahshua, he's not prophesying this as a bad thing. He's prophesying it as a good thing, that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and Israel would be raised so they could start again. So the new would come, the birthing would come to pass. That just turns everything on its head right there. It turns the whole passage on its head. The abomination of desolation in Luke 21, 20 through 24. This writer says, Jerusalem, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, I wish I had written the rest of that there. Then you'll know the time. I don't have, maybe somebody can get that for me. Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Then the time of desolation, the abomination, it says. That's it. The abomination is near. Look it up, please, and, and see it for yourself. I, I missed that. In 66 AD, the ruler, governor of Syria under Rome, Cestius Gallo, took an army, a legion, a Roman legion, and invaded Jerusalem. 
that actually got through the walls of Jerusalem and took over Jerusalem in 66 AD. Jerusalem was taken over by the Romans. Then something strange happened. Joshua said, flee to the mountains when you see the army surrounding. What happened was they desecrated the city, the Romans, under Gallo, and then they just left. They just left. They packed up one day and left. Josephus was the general of the Israeli army. And he says, we can't understand why they had won the war. They had the capital in their hands. And then Gallo takes his troops, marches out of the city towards Caesarea, and his troops, right down to him, are all destroyed by the Lestai the gangs on their way up to Caesarea, Caesarea. No, no idea why this happened, except it was a miracle for the time being so that all things could come to pass. You see, Revelation, the apocalypse, talks about a seven-year period of some of the worst things that could possibly happen. 66 AD, when Castius came into Jerusalem, that was the beginning of the seven years. What also happened at that same time was the emperor Nero, called on the prosecution of all Christians in the empire. And I have a theory as to why. When we read the letter to the Romans by Paul, Paul writes to Seneca. Seneca is the philosopher who is Nero, who is the beast, who is Nero's guardian. Seneca writes to Paul, I am reading your letters to Nero in hopes that he will come on board with us and leave you guys alone. Seneca writes another letter. I am not making much headway with Nero, and especially not with Popeia, the queen, but I'm going to keep trying. Next letter. Paul, I'm sorry this is happening to all your people, but remember, you personally will be have nothing to worry about because you're my friend and I'm Nero's guardian. Next letter, it doesn't come because Seneca is commanded by Nero after 13 years of service to cut his veins. In the letter to the Romans, in chapter 16, it's full of very important people, people that we can know and recognize. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, there is the name of Epaphroditus, who was Nero's secretary and freedman, and the one that helped Nero kill himself, and maybe not kill himself. The people that Paul knew were high up, senators, Herodian royalty, but I've been through this a hundred times. He sends the letter to Rome. He's never been there before. It's in the hands of his friend Seneca and Nero reading his letters. Where do you think the persecution started? I suspect when Nero burned down Rome, Rome and Jerusalem were burning at the same time. That's why the whore of Babylon in Revelation is both cities. Who do you think he started with when he began to blame the Christians, Christianoi, for burning the city? He probably said, look, we got these letters. Praetorian guard, look these people up. This guy is so stupid that he writes a letter to Rome and sends it to Seneca. Let's get them. Go get them. Round them up. We're going to make examples of them first. Take a look. Female apostles. Female women who had suffered in jail in Romans 16. Druids in in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Druids, Druid royalty, also 1 Timothy chapter 4. Herodian royalty. Paul says that he is a kinsman to the Herods. In Romans 16, Herodion, that is Herod the fifth, and his mother Salome, the very one that danced before Herod Antipas for the head of John the Baptist. That's when the Great Tribulation began. 66 AD, and that's the same time that Castius left Jerusalem after surrounding it. Great Tribulation, three and a half years. The Neronian persecution was from 66 till 70. It, it lasted, uh, Nero disappeared in 68, presumably dead with a head wound that Paul's friend, um, I just mentioned his name. Who is it? No, Epaphroditus inflicted on him. Epaphroditus would go on to live 30 more years before Domitian had him killed for murdering Nero. Some things are crazy. All right, I told you a lot of stuff right there. That is the abomination of desolation in the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, three and a half years, takes us up to 70 AD from 66. Yahshua says those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Yes, some got away. The Pella flight. Look it up or look on uh, jspresents.org. I got all this stuff on there if you want to know more about it. Uh, this is an important part next. 
The one on the roof must not come down to take anything out of his house. The one in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Just get out of there. In another place, in Luke, it says that one, two are in the field, one's taken, one is left. That's the rapture, right? Hardly. You want to be the one that's left because if you're taken along with nearly two million other people, you're taken off by the Romans into slavery. One is taken, one is left. You don't know which one it's going to be. Two women in the field. One's taken, one is left. You want to be taken? Revelation talks about this very thing. It says, if you're captive into captivity, you will go. I mentioned to you again that the Romans took at least two million people into slavery and in Jerusalem alone killed up to a million people that were there when the time came in 70 AD at the midpoint of the seven years. It's spoken of in Revelation. The mystery is history. Tell your guy on YouTube. Go read your history book. Go read Josephus. Anybody can learn this and find out there's nothing to fear from this crazy stuff like, like the sky falling or Florida again sinking in and all those other things. You, you who have listened to me this time know that I keep saying Yellowstone blowing up. Or is that Jellystone? It's one of those two. Flee. Don't take anything back. Don't get a cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant and those nursing their babies in day, those days. If you were left in Jerusalem, you were doomed. You were doomed. They believed nobody could get through those walls, and it was difficult to do so. And the general that finally came back to surround the walls, that is Titus, who later became an emperor in 70 AD, begged the people through his interpreter Josephus to surrender. If you surrender, you two million people inside the walls of Jerusalem there for safety, where Yahweh has has pushed you all down from northern Israel into the stronghold of Jerusalem, pushed you down there to clean this place up, help us, help me clean you up. If you come out of here and surrender, you can go home. But if you don't surrender, we're going to kill every last one of you in the most horrid ways you can imagine. Surrender. Those that were in charge in Jerusalem were the head of the Lestai, the bandits. There were three of them in there. Listen to another uh, session for, for the names and all. They would not let anybody go. Nobody could go. Anybody that tried to leave was killed. It got to the point in the course of the siege of Jerusalem, talk about famine, that John of Giscala, the head Lestai in there, burned all the food supplies. He burned them all. He burned the food so the people couldn't leave. So they'd get weak and they starved and starved and they begin to eat corpses and eat babies. It was a horrible time and a fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament about a woman eating her child. Again, this is all recorded by the historian Josephus, who was there at the wall. Great suffering in 21. Unlike anything that has happened from the beginning of the world until now or ever will happen, that is not an understatement. Read the history. This is not an understatement. What am I saying here? I'm saying that Yahshua has prophesied something that was to come to pass almost immediately. I just want to take your eyes down one place real quick, so make sure we get there. And that's to Matthew 24, 34. He says only the Father knows. Not only the Father knows when it's going to happen, and then he tells us when it's going to happen in Matthew 24, 34. He says, I'm telling you the truth now. This generation, hey, Ganea, Genea, and I've used that word many times. This generation is speaking of gene, gene woman, gana, gynecology, gynecology, a coming forth, this coming forth, this generation coming forth. We see the same word in the word generation, gin, will not pass away until all these things take place. He genea oteos an panta tauta genete till all these things are birthed. Biblical generation, no doubt what that is. Yahshua here is prophesying about 30 AD. One biblical generation is 40 years. Think of the generation in the wilderness. Think of the time in the desert, 40 days. 40 years. He says no one knows. And then he tells them exactly when. And they remember this. He tells us later in the historian that they remembered this prophecy. And when Jerusalem was surrounded, and they, and uh, this is the reason that Kestius went away, they got out then before Titus came and destroyed the whole thing. Time is it. Okay, been going an hour. 
Um, I wanted to quit this at about this point before we get to some of the hairier questions, which we'll do next time. But a couple of things. Matthew 24, 25. Remember, I told you ahead of time. He's saying, look into this a little further. I'm telling you this is going to happen. Why is it that you have to realize this? Because it's happening in your lifetime. Why doesn't he say, oh, don't worry about this, fellows. This is happening in thousands of years. Or in Revelation, he says, behold, I come quickly. Or he says, the things that, you, that I talk about will come to pass soon. Oh, no, he's wrong. Two, three thousand years. Soon. Remember, Revelation, the apocalypse, is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Matthew 24. <laughs> I told you ahead of time. Why? Because you're going to be there. Then if someone says, you look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe them. For just like the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so the coming parousia, the presence of the Son of Man will be. This word lightning, we're thinking about this lightning in the sky going from the east to the west, crash. Well, Brother Lee and I looked it up. We discussed it, and we see that there is another important meaning for this word, astara. It means enlightening, a gradual enlightening, as in knowledge. Daniel says knowledge will be increased. A gradual enlightening from the east to the west. So we understand this as the gradual enlightening regarding the fact that Messiah came and his brother Yaakov Hazadik were martyrs for the cause, and so was the other brother, Shimon Bar Cleopas, martyred later by crucifixion. They were the heads and pillars of the assembly. For just as the lightning comes from the east, the enlightening from the east and flashes to the west, I don't think flashes is in there, so is the presence of the Son of Man will be. And then it says, wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. He's talking about something that's dead. Where the corpse is, actually the, words, the word back in there is eagle. Eagles were gathered. But this particular translation is correct in saying the corpse, the corpse is Jerusalem. It was declared a corpse from five of the Old Testament prophets. There the buzzards will gather. And that's where they all were. All the buzzards that could afford to go down there, all the wicked landlords, all the despotic rulers, all the high priests, all in Jerusalem thinking, I'm safe here. Nobody will molest me. The vultures were gathered there, and every one of them, as Titus promised, because their leaders would not would not um, quit, even up till the end, when they will be given amnesty, every one of them. One high priest, he escaped. Two of them. Let me tell you about him. One was the guy, Matthias Theophilus. Why did he escape? Because he was Josephus' father. Josephus' father was stuck in there, and his mother and his brother. They were stuck in there, and they were put in a dungeon for the whole time. There's another one that escaped. I'm trying to think of his name. Sabua. He was a high priest. Listen to his scheme. Here's a great scheme. The, there was a little amnesty by the new emperor after Nero. Bring your dad out if you want to. So one of the chief priests, Ben Sabua, I think his name was, he puts himself in a coffin, and he has his disciples to take him out, but he's alive, okay? So what they advise him to do is, you're dead, you've got to smell dead. So Ben Sabua fills his mouth up full of, what do you, can I say it? It's a four-letter word that starts with S. Dung. Dung, yeah. Fills his mouth full of manure and gets in and is nailed in the coffin. Of course, the Romans are going to look. They open the coffin, and it smells so bad that they say, shut it up again. And he gets away. So one high priest escaped by taking a mouthful of manure. Ah, that sound terrible? Woo! It's all in the history book. Okay, let's see. The corpse says the vultures gather. I think I'd better stop here because uh, I want to introduce you to some people. First, I'd like to introduce you to Rex Harris, not Rex Harrison. You, you feel like coming up and saying a word? Sure. Okay, here's Rex Harrison. He's from the notorious Fort Pierce, Florida, and he's recently come around here hanging around. He's, he's a great, he's going to be a great worker. What he does is just what we need. So what do you 
what you want me to say. Well, I, I'm going to tell a joke, you know, right. just keep it clean. Well, yeah, I'll keep it clean. Hi, guys. Good to see you. My name is Rex Harris. I'm from Fort Pierce, Florida. I actually found Jackson on the internet. I've been looking for uh, some answers to some questions for a long time, and he's helping me get some things sorted out. So it's great to see you. And it turns out we have the same software in common, so that's cool, that's too. Right. Small world. So hopefully you guys got something out of tonight, because I know that I certainly did. And I really don't know any jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so but i'm sure you'll be seeing me around it's been fun here tonight and uh look forward to spending some more time with you guys great and i brought my pencil that's good because you won't find one around here how about you janiel would you like to say a word these we got folks here that you know you know these people they're from oregon they're over here to check out how we're wasting money demanding financial statement no no i'm telling you ah listen they brought cheese bread and wine and you know brother shroom cough isn't even here tonight enjoy it we got some left over though you want to come up sure they just got and this is bob you've seen bob on here all the time are you the one you call yourself malto meal bob that's it malto meal bob that's it bob and janelle come on come on up here this is my wife this is my wife janelle hi we're both from oregon and I've probably talked to some of you guys, although I don't have my glasses on, so I... Oh, yeah. Brad, BJ, Glenda, Lee. Oh, Lee. Yeah, I think I know Lee. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, we made it out here because of... Uh... We killed two birds with one stone. My uh, sister's here, just south of here, and uh, we figured we're not going to miss the opportunity to get up here and, and, you know, just see how they're messing things up. But, uh, and so, I yeah. do do financial statements, so. Uh, oh. You're in bad shape now. <laughs> <laughs> just teasing. Anyway. We can put on a book sale. That's right. Book sale. He's going to write a book and not give it away. That, that, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> I just had some time. Write another book and actually sell it. <laughs> and uh, I'm coming back for January. All right, for the boot camp. Now, I'm sure I'll see some of you guys here probably, too. We're going to have a great time. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Anyway, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> you sure you don't want to come up? No. Okay. I'll, I'll get you one of these times. Why do we do this? Because we want you to believe. We know that you're post-Christians, most of you. And some of you, like me, post-Hebrew roots, honestly. We want you to find belief because we want to show you that there is honesty in the scriptures if, if, if you'll open your mind enough to interpret them correctly. And if you can believe that some of it is written as truth and some of it is not purposely. There's another purpose for apocalyptic literature rather than just to try to tell you the future. All right? There's another purpose. You learn the purpose, and then you don't have to defend yourself all the time when you say the earth's flat or that the sky is falling or that Obama's going to serve another term. <laughs> I got a long-standing bet with my mother. She bet me $50. I don't usually bet. My church is against lottery and betting. You can have all the abortions you want, but you can't buy a lottery ticket in my church. She bet $50 Obama was going to stay in another term. I said, Mother, that's impossible. She said, oh, the prophet in Port St. Lucie said so at church. The prophet, she's always right. She prophesied the blood moon. How would she know when the blood moon was going to come? Another term in prison? <laughs> Brad, leave it to you, brother. I'm going to be seeing you pretty soon. Anyway, thanks for coming tonight. I, I, I promise to keep these shorter because I still got uh, five hours of work to do on them. And I'm seeing the folk that are coming here, and I appreciate you staying on because some of this stuff is pretty darn hard. <laughs> Amen. Oh, we're having a great time tonight. I'm going to leave you now. I'm going to get me a glass of wine, a piece of cheese, and a little morsel of bread. I was planning to sign out and, and disappear. Of course, it won't sign out. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please? <laughs> he won't sign out. There it goes. As a favor to me, I wonder if you would smoosh that roach right over there looking at you. No problem. And that's a wrap. Are you gonna eat that? Are you gonna eat that? Are you gonna eat that?
wanna eat that?